Commission, a decision that finally holds the NRC accountable for its failure to act on a known deadly public safety risk that a nuclear accident would represent. For this, Lawrence Crisioni deserves our deep appreciation and the support of an alert citizenry. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Government Accountability Project for nominating me for this award and for Joe Calloway for endowing it and for the Shafiq Nader Trust for uh, this reception. Human experience shows that people, not organizations or management systems, get things done. For those of you not familiar with that quote, it's how Admiral Rickover began a 1982 speech at Columbia University. It's human experience shows that people, not organizations or management systems, get things done. He was, of course, talking about his people at Naval Reactors, about how no endeavor can be successful without dedicated and hardworking people. Our government is certainly testament to that. The organizations put in place by our nation's founders do not function on autopilot. They're only as good as the people implementing them. A submarine can only be as good as its crew. A regulatory agency can only be as good as its engineers and scientists. And also special counsel is only as good as its attorneys. Of course, there is uh, more to success than just people. You know, as crucial as Admiral Rickover's leadership was and as critical the hard work and dedication of engineers was also integral to his success as the blank check that was given him in the 1950s to develop nuclear powered submarines. The Office of Special Counsel, unfortunately, has never had such a blank check. They've been underfunded, understaffed since their inception. But we are very lucky, nonetheless, to currently have excellent leadership there. U.S. Special Counsel Carolyn Lerner certainly falls into the category of people who get things done. I, yeah, I've heard complaints among many people in the whistleblower community about the OSC, but it's mainly due to that lack of resources, and it's not to the caliber of their current leadership or their staff. We understand that they have limited resources, and when you, in that situation, you need to triage. You cannot look into everything that, that you would like to. And as far as those uh, monetary concerns, they're certainly felt by non-government organizations like the Shafiq Nader uh, Trust. And I've, I've had good luck and bad luck with getting NGOs to, to assist me. And uh, you know, I've always understood those monetary and staff constraints. And I've always been appreciated, appreciative when, I, when I've gotten help. And I'd like to thank some of those people here tonight. Well, three years ago, the officer, the, the NRC's inspector general sought a felony indictment against me for sending some embarrassing information to Congress. And those documents detailed a significant public safety concern. The issue was about flooding, the type of flooding that caused the nuclear accident at Fukushima in Japan. The Coney Nuclear Station in South Carolina is less than uh, 10 miles from Clemson. It's three reactors on the shores of Lake Kiwi are about 10 miles downstream of the Lake Chilkassee Dam. Since 1993, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has known that were the Lake Chilkassee Dam to fail, the reactors at Oconee would move more than 17 feet underwater. In September 2008, and that was uh, two and a half years prior to the Fukushima accidents in Japan, Duke Energy predicted the following sequence of events were the Lake Chilkassee Dam to fail. The floodwaters would reach the Oconee Nuclear Station in about five hours and would cause a loss of the equipment necessary to remove decay heat from the reactor cores. The reactor cores would start to melt down within eight to nine hours. The containment buildings would fail within, 15, within 59 to 68 hours, 
causing a significant radiation dose to the public. Now, now those are Duke Energy's words. Uh, but what we're talking about here is a multi-state permanent evacuation. Uh, unlike Fukushima, Oconee is not along the coast. You know, at, at Fukushima, for about 85% of the time that that accident was going on, uh, the winds were blowing out to sea. Now, for that 15% when the winds were blowing inland, that's why there's 150,000 people who, in Japan who got permanently evacuated from their homes. Clemson, South Carolina is about 200 miles from the sea. Any way the wind blows, it's, it's going over farmlands, it's going over population centers, it's going over forests. So it's, it's not falling out to sea. And the, the risk that we're talking about at uh, Oconee and a, a lot of these other sites that are downstream of dams, the older reactors, they're about a hundredfold greater than, than what we would allow for a, a new modern reactor. But, you know, the, the NRC, just like a lot of the regulatory agencies, they give uh, great exceptions to money and interests that already have industrial endeavor, endeavors in place. And, um, you know, th these plants still operate. It's, um, my concern was more that we were hiding the issue, not so much as the social issues behind whether or not the, the benefits are there or not. But uh, I, I will tell you that after the Fukushima accident, you know, really drove home a lot of these concerns. And these concerns, you know, didn't come from me. I'm the person who brought them to Congress. Uh, they came from people like Jeff Mittman, who's in, in the back here, one of my NRC colleagues. Um, Richard Perkins uh, led the uh, report, the, the, the team that wrote the report on the, on the issue. You know, these concerns were brought up prior to Fukushima. After Fukushima, what happened was, you know, we had Duke Energy commit to protect against a 19-foot flood at Oconee. Now they only have to protect against a four-and-a-half-foot flood. And that was really due to their implementation of the Fukushima corrective actions, which doesn't make sense to a lot of us, which, which is one of the reasons that in 2012, I uh, shared the Duke Energy correspondence with uh, several congressional offices. And I'd like to point out that none of this information was classified. It wasn't in any way restricted from release by any statute. Now, it had been stamped official use only, but any bureaucrat can write that on a document. I mean, I can write that on an email, no matter what's in it, it doesn't matter. There's no control over that. So, and, and that's not a legal, a, a legal uh, marking, so. But, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, why wasn't this, if it's so sensitive information, why wasn't it uh, classified? Well, the, the reason is because the, there was absolutely no basis for withholding from the public a significant public safety concern like flooding-induced meltdown of three reactors, all right? Um, it just didn't meet any of our rules for, for withholding. However, the NRC was withholding it from the public nonetheless. Now, the NRC was not pleased with me for sharing this information with Congress, and they were similarly displeased when the Congressional Office leaked the information to Greenpeace. So, uh, the Duke Energy correspondence, I shared, had been downloaded from the NRC's agency-wide document accession and management system. Since I had downloaded it from a government computer network, the NRC's Inspector General requested that I be indicted on computer fraud. So I don't know who in this room has ever been interrogated by federal law enforcement agents, but it's a pretty unnerving experience. To be sworn under oath by armed agents, to be told that you have a right to remain silent, but your silence can be used against you in administrative hearings regarding your continued employment, and for nearly four hours to be asked questions. And those questions are not being asked in order to understand what occurred. They're being asked for no other reason than to build a felony case against you, to discredit your motives, to paint you as unreliable, 
to question your professional credentials. Credentials. <clears throat> you know, one of the things I was grilled over was who in Congress released the information. I was directed to speculate. Well, I I didn't really know who in Congress had released it. I had some ideas. Um, you know, Mr. Riccio had uh, asked me certain names of who I might have sent the, the documents to. I gave him the list of the staffers that had it. Uh, one staffer asked me a little, you know, a day later if I could resend the information to him. You know, I mean, these congressional staffers get hundreds of emails an hour. So the fact that it got lost in his inbox didn't surprise me. And the fact that maybe if Greenpeace was asking him about it, he might want to review it again didn't seem an issue to me, but it's certainly something that the IG wanted to know. And I, I personally have an issue with executive branch agents using their law enforcement credentials to investigate the holy legal doings of the legislative branch. Now you got to remember, I, you know, we have laws against releasing classified information, and I, and I understand that the FBI has every right to investigate illegal activity on the part of Congress, but you have to remember these are documents that there was no legal statute restricting their release. You know, I had administrative commitments that I couldn't release them publicly because some bureaucrat had stamped them official use only. There is no legal basis at all, no, nothing preventing Congress from uh, asking Greenpeace their opinion on it, nothing preventing Greenpeace from sharing them with whoever they wanted to once they got their hands on it. But yet the IG wanted to know who in, who in Congress had released that, and I'm sure they wanted to know because they wanted to know what offices the NRC shouldn't be sending information to, and they were abusing their law enforcement authority to uh, find that out. Well, it took a lawsuit, but I, I do have the audio disc if anyone wants to hear for themselves what I'm talking about. So, Well, I came out of that experience convinced that I was going to lose my job and at the same time would be faced with the prospect of having to defend myself against trumped up felony charges. I spoke with five attorneys, all of whom laid out for me roughly the same scenario. They all told me the government has no case against you. However, it does not mean you will not be indicted. If you are indicted, the government will make you an offer. Quietly resign from your job and give up all your rights to any whistleblower claims, and they will drop the indictment. If you're given this offer, you need to seriously consider it. If you're indicted, you will need a criminal defense attorney. Defense attorneys need to be paid up front every month. Expect to pay $60,000 to settle your case and $400,000 if it goes all the way through a jury trial. If you're indicted, not only will you immediately lose your job at the NRC, you will likely be unemployable in the nuclear industry. Meanwhile, you will need to come up with you know, 3K to 10K a month for your attorney bills. If you've run out of money along the way, You'll find yourself with no job, no health care, six figures of legal bills, and likely pleading guilty to a misdemeanor you did not commit just to get the felony charges dismissed. Well, luckily for me, the felony charges never materialized. The NRC Inspector General venue shopped all the way out to Springfield, Illinois, in search of a U.S. attorney willing to indict me. But in the end, the Department of Justice declined his request. So at the time, and, and I believe currently still, the U.S. attorney in Springfield, Illinois, is a man named Jim Lewis, who started off his career in the 1960s in Mississippi as a civil rights attorney. So he's a really good guy. He's not the type of guy who's going to throw out trumped up felony charges at a uh, federal regulator. But, um, and, and I don't, I don't know anything about the U.S. Attorney in Eastern Maryland or in the District of Columbia, the uh, other two venues that the NRC could have used. But I assume that the reason they didn't go there was because they know the Attorney Generals or the U.S. Attorneys there are uh, similarly ethical. 
but we're all adults here, and we all know that you know there's 94 U.S. attorney districts in this country. Somewhere out there in those 94 districts, there is a district, there is a U.S. attorney who would have played the government's game and would have, even though he knew there was nothing illegal with what I'd done, granted the IG his felony indictment to use as a bargaining chip to get rid of a wayward federal employee. And luckily for me, I, I didn't live in that person's district, whoever it might be. Well, of course, I didn't know about Mr. Lewis's declination for at least another 15 months. I, I found out about it through the Privacy Act. Well, <clears throat> it was kind of a trying time, um, especially for my wife. You know, she had just finished uh, breast cancer treatments. Um, and I, I can tell you she didn't sleep for five months, you know, just worried about my job, her health care, me even going to jail. You know, I mean, I couldn't really convince her that, look, I didn't do anything wrong. It's, it's ridiculous that I go to jail. Um, you know, she's not really uh, as knowledgeable of the law and, and, and things as a lot of people are. Well, wh one of the things that helped me get through that time was Tom Devine and the uh, Government Accountability Project. When Tom Devine and Louis Clark heard about my situation, they offered to represent me pro bono. And I'll tell you that it's really um, was a big lift off my shoulder, you know, knowing that um, I wouldn't have to accept any NRC offer, you know, to, to sign away my whistleblower rights, that I could fight them in court, you know, that, that I did have the resources now to do that. So, and, you know, like, like the Office of Special Counsel, GAP does have limited resources, and, but they do do a lot with what they have, you know, Tom and Louie are certainly people who get things done. In fact, la last Saturday around noon, I was in a church waiting for my daughter's wedding to start when Tom Devine called me to chat about my OSC referral. And, you know, that's when he calls on Saturdays, on Sunday evenings. I read emails that were often sent close to her after midnight. So, you know, he's working late hours and weekends to help us. I've already mentioned in the, in the audience is uh, Richard Perkins, who, um, and Jeff Mittman, some of my NRC colleagues. Uh, they were instrumental in getting the flooding concerns addressed from a technical perspective. Uh, there's a lot of other colleagues I could mention. A lot of them probably wouldn't appreciate me mentioning their names, not that they wouldn't want you knowing them, but there's people at the NRC who they would prefer not to uh, see their names. But it, it's, it is the technical staff such as them that allow our bureaucracy to function and to not be captured by moneyed interests. Also in the audience is Jim Riccio of Greenpeace, and Jim was instrumental in getting the nuclear flooding concerns exposed through the FOIA process. I, I don't know if Jeff Rook is in the audience of uh, Public Employees for Responsibilities, but uh, Peer versus NRC uh, caused most of the documents I provided to Congress to be released on the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, peers' assistance was, assistance was really vital to my mental health. I mean, I, in 2013, I knew that if I could get a judge to release the flooding documents under the FOIA, then I would be able to undermine the NRC's efforts to indict me. But I couldn't afford to, afford to process my own FOIA lawsuit, and peer agreed to seek the documents for me since the flooding issue was a concern to them as well. I'd also like to mention Paul Gunter of Beyond Nuclear and Lucas Hickson of uh, environmental archives for their efforts in getting nuclear issues exposed via the FOIA. Uh, Dave Lockbaum of the Union Concerned Scientists and uh, former NRC uh, Inspector General Agent George Moley are not here tonight, but they were instrumental in commenting upon the NRC's response to the U.S. Office of Special Counsel regarding the flooding issues. Uh, Mr. Lockbaum's assistance has been crucial in many instances regarding the flooding concerns and in other nuclear safety issues I've dealt with over the years. So a corollary to Admiral Rickover's quote would be that human experience shows that people, not organizations or management systems, retaliate against their subordinates. That is, it's, it's people who retaliate, not organizations. All right, people, not organizations, accept and adapt to situations they know to be wrong. 
the tendency to downplay problems instead of actively trying to correct them comes from people and not their organization or management systems. It was a person, the NRC's Inspector General, who chose to use his law enforcement authority to retaliate against me. But luckily, there have been other people who have foiled their, that retaliation. I've survived as long as I have at the NRC because I have been fortunate to have immediate superiors who, although I might always, not always agree with their decisions, I, they always do what they believe to be right. I unfortunately cannot say that about the entire organization at the NRC. I have found the NRC to be primarily concerned with protecting their own image and that of the commercial nuclear industry. I cannot, I cannot stress to you how important non-government organizations are in balancing the influence of the nuclear industry over NRC policies. Non-government organizations have been a, a vital part of America for centuries. I mean, the term NGO is, is pretty recent, but when you think about it, the uh, abolitionism, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement, those were all initiated by extra government organizations, many of which, like politically active churches, the NAACP, the ACLU, they're, they're still active and around today. But in this modern era, you know, in our lifetimes, We've seen a new type of NGO crop up whose specific role is to ensure corporate influence does not diminish government regulation. And although Ralph Nader might not have had a hand in most of those, I'm not alone in believing him to be the godfather of all of them. So. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank Kay and Leo Dry and uh, all the philanthropists who, like Joe Calloway, are vital to funding the NGOs that protect the public from government abuses. Thank you.